My name is Joseph Dubois and I am the adult programs librarian at the Slover Library. We're based out of Norfolk, Virginia, and we're here bringing you our second installment of the Authors Advice Club along with the Muse Writers Center. So I'm joined by Susan of the Muse Writers Center and I'm going to let her tell you about the Muse and introduce today's author. Take it away. Hey everyone, I'm Susan. I'm the Can you all hear me okay? You're good. Awesome. Uh having a few mic issues earlier. I'm the program manager at the Muse Writers Center. Uh, we are a creative writing nonprofit in Hampton Roads, Virginia, but now online and serving all over the world. Uh, we're really excited to partner with Slover and a lot of other local community partners. And we also offer classes, seminars, and workshops for all genres and all ages, all experience levels. Uh, and our summer class schedule is up now. So if you go to the-muse.org, you can look at all of our upcoming classes and workshops. We also offer full tuition assistance to anyone who needs it. So everyone is able to take a class no matter their ability to pay or anything like that. Uh, and for now, they're all online. So pretty easy, easy to hop on to. Uh, but what you're really here for is Leslie. So let me tell you about Leslie. Uh, she has been writing since she could hold a pen and loves getting lost in the worlds in her head. Leslie is an award-winning fantasy and paranormal romance author and her novel Song of Blood and Stone was chosen as one of Time Magazine's 100 best fantasy books of all time. She's equally left and right-brained and studied filmmaking and computer science in college and sometimes dreams in HTML and also helps us with our website over at the news, which is amazing. Um, Leslie hosts the My Imaginary Friends podcast and lives in Maryland with her husband and furry dependents, some of whom I think might be joining us today. We will see. <laughs> see. <laughs> and for the rest, I'll turn it over to Leslie. <clears throat> Hi everyone, thanks Susan. Um, yes, so I primarily write fantasy novels and paranormal romance. Um, a little bit about my background. So I, I always was a writer. My mom was a teacher and she taught me to read and write pretty early. And uh, I wrote my first story when I was like five years old. I still have it. And all through school, I was in writer's workshops. I was on literary magazine and co-edited in, in high school and college. And as an adult, uh, I still wrote, but I never kind of didn't think about getting published. I, I, you know, people would ask me in school, are you going to major in creative writing? And I was like, I don't think that you can eat if you do that. So of course I majored in film, which it makes so much more sense. Uh, but fast forward to me getting married and we moved down to Norfolk, Virginia. I'm originally from Maryland and I didn't know anyone. I work from home. I own my own business as a website developer. So I came across a flyer for the Muse and I was like, oh, I'll take some writing classes. I'll be able to meet people and get out of the house and it'll be great. And it was, it was fantastic. I, I got back into writing regularly, having a regular class where people were expecting words is the best thing. And I ended up taking other workshops, like week long workshops in different places. Um, there's different programs for that. And eventually I started writing what would become Song of Blood and Stone. And at the Muse, I also met um, some other writers and we started an independent literary magazine. So I had done that for several years. And when I started writing my novel, um, my first thought was to self-publish it because we had been publishing this magazine independently. So I knew about making eBooks. I taught myself to lay out print books and um, you know, upload to the retailers and all the things that you do as a self-publisher. And I wasn't sure at that point, this was 2014, 2015, uh, whether a major publisher would be interested in my story. I'd heard lots of horror stories from other Black authors and other authors of color about, you know, being asked to change things or just being rejected because they already had someone, they already had a Black author, or they already had a Latina author, and they didn't need more than one. So I self-published uh, so Song of Blood and Stone at first, and I, I actually self-published the first two books in that series, which is an epic fantasy series. And uh, about a year later, I was contacted by an editor at St. Martin's Press just through my website email form. And she had seen the books online and read them. And uh, initially she asked me to pitch her a new story because uh, it is pretty rare for a big publisher to republish a story that's already been in the marketplace. But eventually that's what she asked to do. And she said that she could bring it to a larger audience. And so I agreed, we took the books that I had published off of the retailers and re-edited them with um, St. Martin's Press and republished them. 
And so now um, I have four books with them. The fourth one is coming out in August, the final book in the series. This is the first one, Song of Blood and Stone. And um, I also still self-published. So I self-published three novellas in the same series because that was important to me uh, to be able to maintain my independence and, and be able to also self-publish as well as go with the traditional publisher. Um, and yeah, now I'm working on new things, a new series, and whatever questions you have about writing or publishing, either self-publishing or trad, traditional publishing, just let me know. You can speak up or put it in the chat, and I'm happy to tell you my experiences or experiences of, of people that I know and have talked to. Um, well, something that kind of surprised you about that, besides the fact that it even happened, because like you said, it's so rare, that surprised you about the transition from being having your book be self-published to having it be republished by this big publisher? Yeah, there were a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of ups and downs. Like um, people will ask me, you know, oh, which one should I do? I'm writing this book and I'm not sure if I should um, self-publish it or get it traditionally published. And getting it traditionally published the normal way is, you know, it's not really a choice. You have to, like you choose to pursue traditional publishing. Um, and so in, with that is usually trying to get an agent and then the agent will sell the book. Uh, so one of the surprising things for me was like I had, when I, when I did my self-published version, I was trying to make it as indistinguishable as possible from the books on the shelf. So I bought, you know, I went through the bookstore and, and I, my own shelves, but I was looking at every like detail. So from the layout to cover, I spent a year researching cover designers and I just wanted to be really professional and really polished. Um, and I was, I was eager to, you know, to do this, the traditional publishing route because I thought I would learn more and eventually bring it back to myself publishing, which is, which is what I've done. Um, so, you know, the thing about working with professionals whose only job it is to do this, like as a self publisher, I was doing everything. So, I mean, I hired an editor and I hired a cover designer, but everything is on you. And um, so my goal was sort of to learn from the professionals and the experts and figure out what they were doing. And there is stuff to learn from them, but maybe not quite as much as I thought. Like there are systems in place at these big companies that do all of these things. So I do have a publicist and you know an, an editor and a copy editor, and there's an art department that I have no idea who they are. I don't talk to them, but someone talks to them on my behalf and I get a cover. Um, but it's not like they have like the secret to becoming a bestseller. Like they don't, they make gambles about what they think is going to sell. So uh, they don't have, like they don't have the secret. They don't have the, the knowledge, you know, like I think if they did have the secret, every single book would be a bestseller, which is not possible, obviously. But they they take a chance and, you know, the way that that it works in for like money wise, like they give you an advance on your royalties. So part of the advance is thinking, you know, we've done calculations. We think this this book could sell this much. So this is, we're gonna pay you, you know, X number of dollars as an advance against future royalties. And hopefully it will make that much and more, and then you will earn out your advance and then you will continue to make money on your book. But, you know, the majority, like over 50% of books don't earn out. So that gamble is, you know, it's just, it doesn't have great odds <laughs> um, because nobody knows. And there's so many different factors at play. Even before pandemic, there was just, lots of different factors. And um, another thing that I discovered, and when I did get an agent, I didn't originally have a literary agent when I did the deal, but my editor at, at one point advised me that I should look into getting an agent. How I did it was I had a literary attorney, so I, I didn't just do it myself. I made sure that I hired an attorney to review the contracts. And, you know, um, so she deals with all kinds of different publishing, but she looked at the contract. She actually negotiated the advance, which is what an agent would do as well. And so she did all of that for me, but I finally did get an agent. And one of the things that she told me was that the publisher's customer is not the reader, which I had no idea. The publisher's customer is the bookstore. So if you ever wonder why are eBooks 1399, you know, from a big publisher, when a self-publisher will be like 299 or 499, if we're getting really fancy 599, but rarely will you see a self-published eBook more than five or 639. But regularly, I mean, you're always paying 11, 12, 13. And that's because the publisher, like Amazon is not really their customer. Amazon is disrupting their business. Barnes and Noble, um, whatever bookstores are left, the independent bookstores are the, are the customers. And so 
they don't want the ebooks to be cheap because they want you to buy the print books because they make more money on the print books. Honestly, I make more money on the print books as the author than I do on ebooks, but um, it's a whole different system. So the things that you look at and the things that might make sense and be logical in the publishing industry, they're not done logically because they have different priorities. And when your priority is making the bookstore happy and not necessarily the end reader happy, which is what you think it would be, then it sort of explains some of the strange things that happens and some of the frustrating things that happen in publishing. Um, yeah, so just kind of having my eyes opened about, about that, uh, you know, they are professionals and they work hard and a lot of the editors, the hours are crazy, you know, um, and they're doing it because they love books and because they want to bring books to the world. But it's still, you know, big corporations, if you're talking about the big five, soon to be big four publishers in New York, because they keep merging and Simon & Schuster is buying Penguin Random House and it's going to be Simon & Schuster, Penguin Random House is one company now. And that's like, anyway, um, yeah, it's a big company. And so there's still a lot of moving parts and a lot of things that even the people that I directly work with, my my team, which is my editor, my marketing people, my publicist, and my agent. But my agent is not at the publishing company, but the people that I work with at the publishing company, we can't always control things. And um, they're sort of grandfathered into the system as it exists. Um, so, okay, question. Could you tell us more about the strange things that happen when bookstores are the ultimate customer and how are bookstores doing? Do you think books will change in the near future? So pricing is one of the strange things. Um, categories and marketing, if you've never done any research in self-publishing, you know, we're all trying to sell books. That's the goal. A self-publisher's toolkit is going to be very different from your publisher, your traditional publisher's toolkit. And it seems strange and counterintuitive. So one of the ways that people find books on Amazon is the way that they're categorized. So when I upload my, my self-published book onto Amazon, I choose categories, and then I also give it my own keywords. And it's basically just a big database. So how do you find things in a database or a search engine? You make sure it has keywords. So if someone is searching for my book, um, you might be searching for epic fantasy, fantasy romance. Sometimes people search for black authors or, um, you know, second world fantasy, as opposed to, you know, there's all these different ways that you can categorize a novel or any, any product, but or any book. So as a self publisher, we spend a lot of time thinking about that, researching the categories, researching what people search for and, you know, what would be a good, what would be good keywords to put on our books. The publishers don't do that because they're not that concerned with what people are searching for. So I, I researched my categories and keywords on Amazon for my books with St. Martin's and they only had two categories when you can have like up to 10. And um, it was just things like that, which are, are counterintuitive because that's not how people are going to find it. You know, it, it goes to that. Um, the pricing and cover design choices, you know, covers, one of the things you learn in self-publishing is that you, you should look at your cover, not just big and on the book, but at the tiny postage stamp size that it is on the screen when it's on a page full of other books on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Apple Books or whatever. And I know that publishers don't consider that. You know, their goal is if it's face out on the shelf in a bookstore, it will stop you. But they're not, only because of the pandemic have they started to do things that self-publishers have been doing for almost 10 years now. And so they're slow, they're slow to change, but they're also huge companies. They're these big, big ships that it takes a really long time for them to, to be, to change and to try to be nimble. Bookstores, bookstores are, depends, like books are selling more. Um, I don't have the statistics, but even through the pandemic, book sales actually rose, ebook and print. And so there was some evidence that indie bookstores are doing okay like not as many closed as they, they thought were going to close, which is sort of bittersweet. Um, but yeah, I think people are, are making efforts to protect their indie bookstores so that it's not just Barnes & Noble, Target, Walmart, you know, the big, the big box stores are kind of now the borders is gone. And, you know, so there might be other players like Books A Million is kind of really second not secondhand books, but they're not like a, a the priority bookstore. They kind of get the books that other people sell away, and that's why they're all discounted. Um, 
so yeah, indie bookstores are are hanging in there and and but they still need a lot of support, I think. And and even, you know, these efforts to try to shop at indie bookstores and to uh, as opposed to doing all of your book shopping on Amazon or something like that are, are still really needed. And do you think books will change in the near future? I mean, audiobook sales are rising, so the more people listen on audio, that's going to keep changing. Uh, some people, you know, it, it's audiobook sales are overtaking ebook sales in a lot of markets. So that is actually interesting. And that can, you know, if you if you think about when you're writing a book, if you're writing it with audio in mind, that actually makes you approach your craft a little bit differently. Like reading things out loud, and I, I think about it now too. I as I write sentences, I'm like, especially when you have dialogue next to something that's not dialogue, and I think about will the audiobook narrator be able to communicate that this person is no longer speaking aloud and this is an internal thought? Because I have a problem sometimes when I listen to audiobooks, understanding that. And then also just are, are these names too close together? Like they, they, they look fine when you read just with your eyes, but listening to the sounds of the words, um, those kinds of things. So I think writing might change because of audiobooks as more people take that into consideration. And like when you listen to a narrator reading it back, you're like, oh, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have done that. I should have reworded that. That's very odd when you hear it. Uh, books themselves, I think they're so old that they're going to be okay. <laughs> like there's not, you can disrupt to a certain degree, but there's so many people that still love the printed page in terms of print books versus all these other formats. So there, I think they're going to coexist um, for a long time, honestly. Does anyone else have any questions? Do you have any tips on how to get your book or your manuscript um, in perfect order before approaching a publisher to make sure that it, or to increase its ability to be accepted? Sure, yeah. It's interesting because I think maybe even 10, 15 years ago, editors would would nurture authors a bit more. Now there's, there's less of that. You, you can still find it sometimes, but you kind of have to come as polished as possible. I know people who are, you know, who still want to be traditional, but will hire um, a freelance editor to review their book before they submit to agents or editors. Some agents are editorial and will work with you on the book. I mean, most agents will work with you to a certain degree, but um, even to get an agent, you know, they're looking at, I think my, my agent says she gets something like 25,000 manuscripts a year. It's a really startling number. And so to to just get out of the slush pile, you know, whereas maybe a decade ago, it's just the potential and and they knew that they could hone the talent and, and find the diamond in the rough. It really is about presenting something as polished as possible. So workshopping definitely helps, beta reading, getting other people's feedback on it. You know, if you're not gonna go to the step to actually pay money for an editor, which if you're trying to be traditionally published, you shouldn't have to. Um, I will admit that even, you know, with my contract at one point, I did hire an editor because, uh, you know, I loved my editor, but she just wasn't, she was okay with the book the way it was and she was ready to to put it out. And I was like, no, I'm not happy with it yet. And I wanted to work on it some more. So I actually paid money to the editor that I had worked with when I was self-published in order to make sure the book was the best it could be. Because sometimes their standards are going to be different than yours too. And, and it's like, oh, this is good enough. But it, but it wasn't good enough for me. Um, but yeah, just getting in the door, whatever research you can do and, and getting feedback from readers um, to to have that, that really polished product that, um, you know, you can still, you probably still will have to work on, on with an editor on some parts of it. But just, you know, continuing with your craft is, is super important too. Um, so Connie asks, can you talk about how you are promoting your books? It is, it can be hard. Um, so I think a newsletter is important for all our authors, no matter how you publish. And my newsletter is sort of my first line of defense. Social media to a certain extent, there's all of these conflicting ideas about whether or not social media sells books. I think it, it can, it absolutely can. It just depends. Like I don't enjoy being on social media. So I'm not there a lot. Uh, I try to check in every day on my different channels to make sure no one's like, talking to me or asking me questions or something, but so I'm just, I'm also very busy and I just don't enjoy being there. 
So I do a lot of events. I do conferences with fantasy. There's all kinds of local and national cons in, in your area. So I'll be at Balticon for the Baltimore Science Fiction Society uh, at the end of the month. Yeah, there's just my events page is always full of things. So I, I do a lot of events just to try to reach new new readers. Um, the newsletter is also how to reach the existing readers because people who read you might not read everything and there might be more books that they can read from you. And then mix that with the um, the social media and sort of networking. I mean, doing events and going to conferences helps with networking because word of mouth is still actually extremely important. Um, then there's things like bookstagram tours. So, um, you know, putting your book on Instagram and blog tours, which are less effective than they, they, they used to be. But if you, you know, you're getting those pockets, you're getting those, those people's audiences, no matter how small they are. And that can, that can be helpful too. But yeah, marketing is always sort of the uphill battle. It's like trying to figure out where to spend your time. Uh, I try to spend my time on the things that I enjoy more than spending time on things I hate, because I feel like that comes through and, and nobody wants to experience that or have that energy. Um, okay, writing process. Using to be a born creator, but for those who are struggling, can you tell us how you keep going, how you plan your books? Structure and plot. Um, yeah, I love talking about plot. <laughs> That's one of the reasons I started my podcast, because I kind of do a weekly, this is what's going on in my writing world this week. That's what my podcast is. I don't do interviews. It's sort of like a diary or a journal, because I heard someone say that podcasting is the new blogging. And I was like, yeah, I. it will take me just as long to write a polished blog post as it will to talk for 20 minutes and edit it and put it up there. So. Anyway, I am a plotter as opposed to a pantser. So I do like to plan everything out. And especially with fantasy, like I, I do know authors who are not plotters who write fantasy and it's always amazing to me because um, my camera fixed. There are, there's just so much to hold in your head, right? And so I also believe in fast drafting. So I used to do NaNoWriMo every year and fail and, uh, until I just, I went to some workshop uh, somewhere and I heard about fast drafting, which is basically writing your first draft as fast as you can without stopping or reading or editing or going back. And it's perfect to try for NaNoWriMo since, you know, for a lot of people, 50,000 words in a month is a lot, is a lot to do, you know, and if you haven't done that before, it seems impossible. But the way that I did it, the other important part of my process and craft is my community. So I had met a couple of other writers at a workshop. And we got together online every day and we wrote. And this was during NaNoWriMo. This is the first year that I actually won. And because we were sitting down on Google Hangouts or whatever it was at the time, uh, every day and just, we'd set a timer, we would write silently, like we're just clicking. And we, at the end of the timer, we would say, how did we do? So we have a goal. Like we're gonna, we're gonna set the timer for 25 minutes and I wanna have 500 words or a thousand words or whatever. And you either meet the goal or you don't, but the, you keep writing until you do. So having the community of people like accountability is really important, um, fast drafting. And so turning off my editor so that I'm not rewriting chapter one for a year. I did that for a long time. And then when I finally got to the end, I realized I have to change chapter one again, because by the time I got to the end, I realized all the stuff that I didn't know. So why did I spend so long on chapter one? Don't do that. Write the whole thing. And then, you know, even if you, you know, in chapter five, you realize, oh, I really should have done this. Make a note and then go write chapter six. Like, don't go backwards. That really changed the game for me. That's been super helpful. Um, and yeah, like a lot of times if you're struggling, it's kind of like, why do you want to do this? If you can reconnect to the reason you want to be a writer, the reason that you love books, you know, your voice. I, I do believe that everybody's voice deserves to be heard. There's someone out there who needs to hear what you have to say whether it's someone of a similar background than you or someone who just deserves to hear your story, it will brighten their day. Um, one of the best things I ever heard from a reader was that they were you know, undergoing chemotherapy and they were just reading a bunch of books while they were in chemo. And she wrote me to tell me how much she loved my books. And it was just so heartwarming. It was like someone's having a really bad time. And you know what I wrote brought them a little bit of joy during this time. And, and those are the reasons I kind of go back to when I don't feel like writing and it's hard. And it's just like, well, somebody out there would really appreciate and enjoy the story. So I'm going to keep continue and I'm going to give it to them. So yeah, and then craft books. I'm always reading more craft books. I, I'm in a class right now. I'm always continuing to um, hone my craft. And I think that's really important. 
for whatever stage you're at, no matter how many books you write, you never know everything, you know, there's more, there's always more to learn and there's always another level that you can get to and it, it helps. Um, Melissa asks, do you have to pay for a certain number of books in advance? One publishing house is considering my manuscript and wants us to agree to buy a certain number of books up front. You should not have to pay anything if you're being published by a legitimate publisher. Um, I might need more information on that. It sounds like it might be a vanity press. Like if they're charging you, then that's a red flag. If they are supposed to be a publisher, publishers pay you, they don't charge you. So like my publisher, I, I get paid in advance. I also get 20 books, um, but like author copies of books that I get for free to either give away as, you know, give away prizes or whatever. Um, now, if you wanted to self-publish, then you're paying for, you know, whatever you're paying for, but there's no agreement to buy a certain number of copies. So whatever company that is, I would be very wary of them and uh, definitely check out like Google Writer Beware. Um, that's a, there's a website called Writer Beware where they tell you about predatory practices. And there are a bunch of companies that are very predatory that do things like charge you and make you buy 500 books and things like that. So I would steer very clear of those. There are plenty of reputable places where if you want to get editing, cover design, uh, printing all in one shop, you can. Uh, so yeah, just if you want to clarify that, let me know. Tell me the company name. Um, Jerome asks, how did, much did you invest in self-publishing? How much should someone expect to invest? I set a budget for myself for my first book for at $2,500. And that was because it was my first book. I knew I was going to have to spend more on editing. I think you can spend less as you get better, but I was still not that good yet. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure I had a developmental edit and a copy edit and a proofread and then the cover. And so, yeah, I, I sort of looked around, I joined author communities, I asked people and people can, you can do it for less, but that was my budget. I think that you should expect, you know, at least a thousand dollars. You can get a cover, like a pre-made cover. that's not completely customized to you. You can get for, you know, 25 to a hundred dollars and then editing really varies. And if you can't afford editing, um, you know, there's other options you can barter. You can work with newer editors who are cheaper, but I wouldn't a full length novel. So anything between like 60 to hundred thousand words, I think you're gonna, it's going to be difficult to have a really professional product for under a thousand dollars. Um, so anywhere between that and, and, you know, one to $2,000, I think you, you would expect to spend. People do Kickstarters if, um, if that's a lot, you know, if that's more than you can afford. Um, but it is, I always think of it as, as a product I'm asking people to spend money on. And so every business has costs of, involved in creating the products. And that's kind of how I looked at it. And do you write short stories? I do sometimes. Um, I'm in some anthologies with some short stories. I, I never wrote like the normal path to publication for fantasy writers is you write short stories, you submit them to magazines. There's you know, the big, the big magazines and smaller magazines, and you kind of make a name for yourself and then maybe a publisher will find you, but I just didn't do that. Uh, so I do like writing short stories. I think it's good practice. And I think it's, it's nice to be in anthologies also, because that's that sort of networking factor. A lot of times when you're in anthologies there, you know, you get together and do promotions and then you have other writers that, you know, and maybe they can blurb you or recommend your book so you can work together. And there's all kinds of opportunities that come from working together with other people. So that's a good way to do it also. Um, can you tell what you yourself most struggled with, if anything? At the beginning, I struggled with knowing how to plot. I had uh, I had been at the Muse for a couple of years in workshops and workshops are really great, but they're a micro level. Like you're submitting 15, 20 pages at most and you're getting like line edits on that. But when you're trying to write a book, like it's the macro. And I realized I didn't, I was trying to write this book and I, I was just wandering all around the universe and I did not know how to plot a novel. And so that was something that I focused on really like diligently. Buying several books on plotting, I took another class and there was videos that I watched and I really just tried to spend a few months teaching myself to plot and to structure a novel. Um, and then the same thing that everyone else struggles with, like getting my butt in the chair and, and writing regularly is always difficult. It's, it's much more difficult before you're on, before you have a contract and a contractual deadline. 
because I work really well with deadlines. So I would give myself deadlines. And when I was purely self-published, I would um, contract with my editor and she's very busy. So I knew like, okay, I'm paying her, but if I don't get this book to her when I said I will, she won't have time for another few months. So I'll have to wait. So if you can give yourself as hard a deadline as you can make, like I had actually put a deposit down on my time with her so that it was like money in the, you know, I've spent money, I'm doing this. I don't want to miss my date. Uh, so yeah, that that's another thing. In addition to the accountability partners, having deadlines, uh, especially contract deadlines made it better for me. When you started writing Song of Blood and Stone, did you have the rest of the series plotted out? Were you planning it as a series from the start or did it develop over time as you wrote? Originally, Song of Blood and Stone was supposed to be a novella. It was supposed to be like a 50,000 word, an epic fantasy novella, which is not a thing. I mean, it's just a ridiculous <laughs> thing to, to expect. So I had this idea for one book. And as I was writing that one book and expanding it, so like the version I gave to the editor that I hired, I think it was 50,000 words. And she very kindly told me that that didn't make any sense. And you have to expand, <laughs> like it can't be that. So the, the, the first version was 80, 88,000 words. And as I was writing, I got the idea for the loose idea for the rest of the series. It was like, okay, it's gonna be four books. I was writing it as a fantasy romance. And so like in the romance tradition, I was gonna have a different couple per book. And it was kind of be one overarching story, but each couple, you know, different love story, every book as I told the story. And actually the couples changed a little bit over, over across the way. So I didn't plot the whole thing out. I had like a paragraph for each book, like two or three sentences, like short paragraphs. And I, I knew the basics of the big, of the ending, but yeah, I just, I took one book at a time and then interesting things happened. Like the second book, I thought it was going to be one thing and then I had to split it into two books. So um, what the story that I thought was going to be in the second book was way too much story. And so I split it and then book three changed after that. And in the middle of this, I got the publishing contract. So I had to rewrite books one and two. So book four was always, I never knew what exactly, beyond that paragraph I wrote, it was just like, I mean, I can't think about that while I'm rewriting book two. Like I know three things that are going to happen in this book and that's it. Um, so yeah, definitely developed over time. How do you go about creating a writing schedule that you can consistently stick to while maximizing productivity? Yeah, that is a great question. And that is something uh, just organizationally, like I love schedules and lists and planning. So that's something that I actually like to do. How I approach it is I work backwards from my deadlines. So um, with the traditionally published stuff, uh, there's always a deadline. It's like, you know, give me to this at this time. With the self-published stuff, I create the deadline and I think like what I'm working on now, I want to publish in January. I talked to my, this is a self-published project. So I talked to my agent about potentially selling the audiobook rights. Audiobooks need about three months to produce. So I actually have to finish the book in October, like edited, proofread, everything. So already working backward. So then I booked my editor. I was like, well, I need the proofreader. She needs um, like three weeks going backward like that. So all that, all this, that allows me to create a schedule. So I have these, uh, these calendars that I print out and I, I have two years of calendars and I sort of work backwards. So I, I try to, right now I'm planning like a year and a half at a time because the traditional published books need to be turned in, you know, a year before they publish and it's, and then you're mixing in the self-published stuff. So it's, it's, um, that like, doing my estimates. Okay, so this book has to be done on this day because the editor needs this time and then in order for me to publish it then. And then like on a week to week level, I use a project management system called ClickUp that um, I dump all of my tasks into and then I try to actually place them on a day. So it's like, these are the five things I need to do this week. I'm gonna do this on Monday, this on Tuesday. And, and then on Monday, I'll sit down and I'll plan my day and I'll time box. And if you haven't heard of time boxing, definitely Google that. It's called either time boxing or time blocking. So each day it's like, okay, from eight to 11, I'm writing from 11 to 12, I eat <laughs> from 12 to three. I, you know, 12 to one, I do email to one to four. I'll do like website work. And then I'll do something. I, I, I do every hour of the day. And this is when I'm super busy. 
and um, that helps me not only get the writing done, but I'm still running my business, I'm doing websites, so like half time. And uh, that helps me with my productivity. I do have some slides on my website from a, a talk that I do on writing productivity that may be helpful. I see the website question is answered. Um, have you been in a situation where you have an idea, but you don't know how the story ends? How would you solve this if it happens? Yeah, that happens a lot, um, especially with short stories. And sometimes I will just go with the flow and just be like, oh, I, this is not a thing that is contracted. So I don't have, to, I don't have um, a deadline. I'm just kind of exploring and I'll just write. And a lot of times those don't go anywhere or I'll write for a while. And then at a certain point, I need to know the end in order to finish it. So it depends on what the story is. At this point, I don't start anything that I don't know the end of. Um, like a, a novel, because it's just too much work and it's too much time and I do have deadlines and I that doesn't work for me. Um, but if I'm just like, my mind is full and I want to just sort of creatively explore something. So I'll have like a little kernel of an idea that I'll just go down that rabbit hole and not know where it ends. Um, there are times like it's often a mess <laughs> and then Someone will be like, oh, Leslie, there's an anthology. We need a short story. And I'm like, I started this short story, this meandering short story a few months ago. Now I have a deadline. Now I have to know the end and now I'll finish it. That's how it works for me. Like it's hard for me to finish something if I don't know the end. I hope that helps. Um, okay, so Melissa, I was a little concerned, but it's, it's a reputable company, Wiley. Okay, it's for business books. And her, this is a new acceptable practice. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. I've heard of Wiley. Wiley is a legitimate company. So that, but yeah, that is still concerning about them asking you to buy a bunch of books. I, I would definitely talk to the lawyer and, and have them look the contract over because yeah, it still sounds kind of sketch. Um, fast drafting sounds intriguing. Could you tell us how much you outlined or planned before you began? <laughs> yeah, you have a lot of energy. It's exciting where you are. Um, and did you begin thinking of your story from the beginning as sci-fi fantasy for young adults? So with fast drafting, it only works when I outline. Um, if I try to pants a, a fast draft, then I end up down those rabbit holes. But yeah, so the, I, the outlines vary usually for like a full length book. For me, which is like 80,000 words. So all of the fantasy books are like 130,000 words. Um, but I'm trying to write shorter books now. But I'll have an outline. And when I say outline, there's two things. There's like just the, the, the outline, just the bare bones bullets. And then I take that <clears throat> and I create a synopsis of it. And the synopsis is usually between seven to 15 pages, depending on the, the length of the book. So I don't start writing before I have that. And that's just taking that bullet points and writing a few sentences about each bullet point so I know what happens. Now, generally it changes, even though I plot, I discover things like the plot is good for about 45% of the novel. And then around the middle, things get weird. And I realize, oh no, that's not what should happen. And so I stop and I redo it at the middle. And then I'm usually good. Sometimes at the end again, like the last third, I'll have to stop and redo it again. But there are these points in time where I've had it all planned out and it was all lovely and beautiful. But when you actually start writing, it, it changes. It's different. It always changes. It's fine. You expect that. So I don't try to stick closely to the outline because I need to stick to it because that's just a mistake. Um, yeah. And then the story from the beginning, I, I all my ideas are basically sci-fi fantasy. They're magical or something like that. Technically, these books aren't, aren't YA. They do get categorized as young adult books, um, but they're they are kind of romancy, so there are like open door sex scenes. And I'm always like, ah, just make sure your kids know if that's not okay. <laughs> like young young children should not read them in my opinion, but I've had parents be like, oh, it's fine. Like, that's your kid, you know, do what you want. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do know that they're going to be fantasy and sci-fi generally. The inspiration for Earth Senior Chronicles, um, it, I was watching a bunch of movies one night. I had just come home from a writing workshop and it had been a difficult, a difficult workshop. I was, I had a class with the author Juno Diaz, who was like a Pulitzer Prize winner. He's a genius. He's amazing, but he sort of tore my story apart <laughs> during the worksheet, the workshop. And uh, I, to this day, 
that was 2013 or 2012. I have not gone back to that story again. Like it was a great experience, but I also haven't gone back to that story again, but I was inspired. And so I, I came home and I was watching some movies and there was just a few scenes, like a few just images in my head of, um, in the story, there's near the beginning, Jack has been captured and he's been like beaten and he is uncowed, I think I say. So I had this like fierce, this guy with this fierce expression on his face, like literally that little image. And then an image of a, a girl with a shotgun protecting her home. And those two things were enough to spark the story. So yeah, the inspiration, a lot of times it's just like that. It's it's a song lyric or an image or just some tiny little thing that my mind just takes and, and goes off in different directions with. Realistically, realistically speaking, how much is age a factor for aspiring first time writers? Not as much as you think. I mean, yeah, the publishing industry loves a 19 year old debut author, but um, Maria Vale, who is an author who she didn't start, she didn't publish until she was in her mid fifties. And she's got like these four books that are amazing. Uh, they're wolf shifter romances, but they're like wolves. Like a lot of times paranormal romance is like a man turns into a wolf sometimes. These are like wolves who turn into men. It's a whole different, they're very good. If you look up, I can't remember the name of it, but Maria Vale is her name. And I, I can think of other authors who didn't get published until their 50s or 60s and or, you know, just later in life. It, it's not. Who else was it? The Vine Witch I just read, Luann Smith. I don't know how old she is, but she is de definitely, you know, an adult. <laughs> and probably in her 40s or 50s. So, like, it, it's absolutely can't happen. And there's no reason why it, the book is the book. And sometimes you don't have enough life experience to write anything worth reading until you're past your 20s. No offense to anyone in their 20s who might be listening, because there are plenty of authors who are who have something to say. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't let that stop you. I think that there there is many examples of uh, people who, in their advanced youth who have gotten publishing contracts or have self-published to success and acclaim. Um, I taught myself how to structure a novel. Specific books and videos, yes. Um, that I used to teach myself how to plot and structure. One of the most important ones, there's a video series by the author Dan Wells, and he's a science fiction and fantasy author. And it's his seven point story structure, I believe it's called. It's their old kind of grainy videos. And there's a there's a blog post. Let me see if I can make sure that's the right thing. Um, that was the first thing that I was like, oh, this makes sense to me. Yeah, Dan Wells' seven point story structure. If I can find it, I'll, here's, I'll put a YouTube link in the chat. Let's start with you. Sorry, the... YouTube started playing. Um, so this is like five, I guess it's five videos. And then there's people talk about it too. So if you Google that phrase, um, you can see more information on that. That was a way that was, it's simple enough. So, cause there's a lot, there's all kinds of, plotting systems. John Tribio has 22 points. 22 is a lot. Seven is, is good to start with. Like if you're if you're not uh, comfortable with plotting, then that was actually where I started. Also, Save the Cat by Blake Snyder. That book is, you know, those two things really set me on the path. And I still use Save the Cat to this day. There's also Save the Cat writes a novel. Because Save the Cat, the book is for screenwriters but novel writers can absolutely use it, but they did write another one that's for novelists. So either either one is fine because they kind of say the same thing. Uh, but yeah, so those are, those are best basically foundational things. If you learn better by video, you know, listening to those videos might help. I don't know if there's a book about the seven point story structure, but um, yeah, th those videos are really cool. And he, Daniel Wells is on the Writing Excuses podcast, which I also listen to if you're into podcasts, along with Brandon Sanderson and Mary Robinette Cowell and um, Howard Taylor. And then they have other other guests too. But it's it's specifically a craft focused podcast for sci-fi and fantasy writers. And there's not a ton of those. And then can I talk about how to use POV? So POV, the point of view, there's um, so usually you're talking about whether it's third person or first person and um, how, how you decide and then how you can use that. 
the way I think about POV is often genre and story. So I, and I, I use both, like the story I'm writing right now is first person, first person present tense. And a lot of times that's used for YA. So you can look at the like, other books in the genre that you're writing in for examples of how to use POV. And that's one, one way to decide. Sometimes it's just the energy and the vibe. Right now I'm writing in first person because I spent years writing in third person. Like Earth Singer Chronicles is seven books all in third person. I was like, it's time for first person. Like that was literally my reason. I didn't do, not necessarily genre or anything. I was just tired of third person. And even as I'm writing it, I slip into third a lot because I've been doing it for so long. But I was just like, I want the energy and the vibrancy. Because a lot of times, you know, you choose first person and especially present tense versus past tense because of the immediacy. Like I am walking down the hall, you know, like you're, you're in the character's head, you're seeing what they're seeing, but it's also difficult because you don't get anything that character doesn't see. You don't know, you know, the reader doesn't know. So third person is a lot easier and a lot more flexible it's just, just be, because you can switch, you know, perspectives or you can draw the camera out. Like I like to use it as like a film metaphor. So there's close third where the third person is like a first person, they know all the thoughts of the character, you know, like Robert was thinking that, you know, it's a beautiful day today, I should go outside. And then, then you can draw it out into more of an omniscient in the same story. So you can sort of zoom out and, you know, describe the room, describe the clothes, and then go into the head of the character. And you, and you can have that flexibility to pull in and out, which you do not have in first person. If you're pulling out in first person, it's going to be weird, you know. Like, I don't know what's happening outside other than what I can perceive from my senses and maybe intuit or guess. Um, and, and different writers have gotten around that in really interesting ways. I remember there's a, a series called Vampire Academy, which is a YA vampire series. And it's first person. But I thought it was really clever because there was something happening that the, that the person didn't know, couldn't have known. But they had set up this whole, like... Um, like telepathy thing or something where they weren't there, but they were connected with their mind and so they could see through the other person's eyes. I thought it was really clever. So if you can do something kind of interesting and innovative, if it makes sense in your genre, I mean, if you're not writing paranormal, then that won't work. But, you know, read a diary or listen to a, a voice message. You can hear, you can find interesting, innovative ways to get the character to know something that they would not otherwise know. Uh, so yeah, there's lots, there's lots of POV. If you had anything specific about POV, but there's lots of different ways to use it to different effects and you kind of have to make that choice up front because if you go through and you then you change I, and i've done this before i started a story in third and changed to first or vice versa and it's more than just changing i to she it's it's a lot of different um the language is different the, because of all that i said like what you notice is different what you can sense is different so you really have to rewrite it and it's yeah I wouldn't recommend it, although I think every writer has done it at least once in their life. And once you do it, you're very careful. You hope that you don't ever have to do it again. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks for all the great questions. Um, and I do talk about this stuff every week on my podcast if you're interested in the sort of week-to-week -week <laughs> life of an author. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you all being here and good questions. Good luck to everybody. <laughs> thanks so much. <laughs> I don't know if Josette or. So, uh, Leslie, sorry, I had a question mm -hmm. and it was more because um, I work here at Slover Library with Josette. Um, and actually, I did a nano remote program with my teens online, which was super interesting. And, you know, I did have a couple of students that like they started out and they started with the plotting and the getting their first draft started and all that. And then they just stopped. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't, they didn't start, they weren't participating anymore. And you said something about how, like, just that NaNoWriMo kind of format um, kind of turned you off. What was it or what do you think could be changed in order to um, bring our, our students back into, into the fold? You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it, it can be really hard because if you feel like you're failing and it's like mm -hmm. you get to the 10th or 15th of the month and you have a thousand words and you know there's no way you're going to do it, that can be really difficult and demoralizing. Mm -hmm. So um, 
the community aspect is is often helpful you know people doing it together and then giving the okay to adjust the goals like it's, it's okay if you don't hit 50,000 you know celebrate like every every milestone if you have like smaller goals like every thousand words to have a celebration or something like that so you can incorporate the people who you know maybe maybe start slow and are feeling overwhelmed at with the pressure you know the quote-unquote mm -hmm. pressure because it's, it's self-induced but you still like you join you want to and, and other people are doing it and you're seeing other people getting these huge word counts so as much yeah. as you can do to um like reduce the pressure and celebrate the wins along the way i think would probably be helpful yeah I, I, when i did it that was a, like i asked them to make goals but i did allow them to you know, reduce their goals if they, you know, got to that point where they just felt like they couldn't get get there and just mm -hmm. put that way. Um, yeah. So, you know, I was flexible with that. Um, and I think that's why most of them stayed with the program that's um, because I was flexible and whatnot. It was just those those few that it 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 becomes as a teacher as somebody that is trying to get the kids really involved in it. Um, it was just discouraging that they they gave up, you know. Especially yeah. since I was very um, flexible and celebrated them every time we met mm -hmm. um, and how we shared our our you know our work. Right. Yeah. I mean, sometimes. I think there's always going to be, be people who drop out. It's just not not for them. But hopefully, maybe next year, try to reach out and see if they can come back. Uh, try yeah. again, yeah. or like Camp Nano, they have the April version and they have it at different times during the. Yeah, day. they have a summer one too. Yeah. Right. Yeah, give them another opportunity um, because sometimes it just takes a few times before you're ready to to sit down and, and commit to it. If, mm -hmm. if you feel like maybe it's not really what you want to do after all, uh, but it's good that you had so many who stuck it through. Yeah, they're yeah. the ones that finished their their stories were just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Sure. Was there anything else that anybody wanted to talk about, discuss, ask questions of? We're technically scheduled until um, seven, but you know we can we can end earlier if need be. Oh, it looks like Michael has a question. Sure. Yeah, apps and programs. Um, I write in Scrivener, and you probably will hear that a lot. For me, writing in Scrivener was what allowed me to be able to write a novel, because I don't write out of order, I write in order, but I do, especially with the fantasy stuff, because there's multiple perspectives, I do um, reorganize things a lot, and doing that in Word was just very difficult. So Scrivener allows you to reorganize scenes and it has a million features that most people don't need all of them, but I, I definitely love Scrivener. Uh, also, like other apps, not so many. I've started using a program called Plotter to help with the plotting, which is like optional, but it's really nice. And it just allows you to lay out in note cards. Like Scrivener has a note card view, but it can be a little clunky. Um, what I like about Plotter is it's just a little bit more elegant in terms of just it gives you suggestions for plotting systems. So you can load up a template with like a save the cat, or uh, I think it has the Dan Wells, it has the you know the main plotting systems that I use, and then just put in your, your scenes and re reorganize them. It allows you to do characters. So you can have your, build your characters in that program. That's something that's fun. Eon Timeline is another program. Um, I'll just put the name in the chat, spelled funny. And if you are doing, especially fantasy, you know, epic fantasy, you have your own calendar or something, or even historicals. I have friends who are historical fiction authors who use Eon Timeline to keep track of real historical events that they're writing about. And it's it's a, a timeline app. It, it integrates with Scrivener in some kind of way, and it allows you to visualize the timelines. I actually used it when I was making my own calendar because I had like different days in the month. You can have alien science fictional calendars, things like that. That's fun. Um, Pro Writing Aid is another tool that I use, which is for editing. So it's like an AI editor. It's like Grammarly, which you've probably seen commercials for. There's a bunch of programs that are like that. I use Pro Writing Aid because I had a coupon for it like a few years ago. Um, but any of those are fine. And because copy editors generally charge, 
it can charge by the hour. Um, I tried to run it through the AI to clean it up as much as possible before I give it to them. The theory being they'll spend less time editing and it might be a little bit cheaper. But I do, I love gadgets. I have this um, free write traveler, which is like a little writing machine. I don't know if you can see it's kind of bright. Um, so it's basically just a keyboard and a tiny screen. I can't make it less bright. There it goes. Um, and there's no internet or anything, but it backs up to the cloud. So when I do fast drafts, because I don't want to edit, and you, it's only like six or seven lines of text on the screen, uh, you can't edit on this. So you just have to write. This is the expensive version. There is the Alpha Smart, which is like the $50 version, which is the cheap version. I'll show you that. And they don't make these anymore, but you can buy them on eBay. Not, it's not backed up to the cloud. I just have to hook it up via USB and send it to my computer. But, you know, this is, my mom was a special education teacher and she used these with her um, special education kids. And because you can drop them, you can step on them. They're hard to destroy. They take three AA batteries and they're tough. So I, this is the first thing I would use when I was fast drafting. Because like, once you get tiny screen, you can't edit. Um, and that just kind of forced me. That's how I won NaNoWriMo also. I got one of these, I heard authors talking about them. And then because I like gadgets, I got like the fa the fancy expensive one, but the Alpha Smart is really all you need. Um, so yeah, gadgets are great. Probably other programs. Oh, Coffeetivity. Coffeetivity is another program that I use that just plays coffee shop sounds on my computer. So even if I go to a coffee shop, I'll listen to the coffee shop sounds because sometimes they're playing music and other stuff I don't want to hear. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of tools. A, a timer is always good. I, I I write in like 20 to 25 minute increments. That's like a Pomodoro technique where you write for, you do a sprint, like a writing sprint. So write for 25 minutes and then pause, uh, take a break, stretch, you know, stretch your wrists, stand up, you know, whatever, and then go back to it again. That's also a technique that I like to use. Um, <laughs> oh, the, okay, yes. The biggest takeaway was to hear that he thought producing 20 pages for classes was micro. <laughs> 20 pages is a lot, I understand, yes. Like when you're doing it every week, it, it's a lot. Sometimes it's like, oh, my pages are due. I haven't written them. I have to come, come up with 20 pages. Um, but yes, like when I started writing, the fourth book in my series is 150,000 words. And it's the longest thing I've ever written. And I never thought I would be able to write anything that long. It's it's crazy, um, but yeah. So those the little chunks grow into bigger chunks, and 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 I love workshopping, and I think that workshopping is really valuable. Um, and if you're if you're a short story writer, then you know it's even more valuable. But if, you know when you're getting into like door stoppers, like and one hundred fifty thousand isn't technically even a door stopper because people have books that are four hundred thousand words, and I don't know how they did that or why, but uh, yeah. I really only write in the mornings now. Another tip that I learned um, from some class that I took somewhere was to write first or as close to first as possible. And that was another huge key. So yeah, I write from eight to 11, if, sometimes 12, but usually by then I'm exhausted. Uh, and in, in that eight to 11 is usually breakfast also. So it's not a full like three hours. Um, I write first. I try to get up and do it as close to first. I don't check email. I don't go on social media. If if I had, you know, obviously I'm, I'm flexible with my job because I'm, I'm self-employed. But when I was a lot more busy, before I stopped taking on new clients, I would get up at six and write for an hour. Like, because there's so many ways to procrastinate. And I would be like, oh, I'm going to write at three. I'm going to take off early. And then at three, I was exhausted. And I'm like, well, I'll just, I'll write at six. And then six came and went and I never wrote. So yeah, and then the rest of my life, it just, yeah, I, I had to try to be more disciplined about the, about the writing just to get it done. Cause I, otherwise I, I wasn't, you know, when I wasn't getting it done, I wasn't happy. And I, I tried to find tools that would allow myself to get it done. And if, as long as I do it first, everything else is like a second priority. Like even work, work and, you know, exercising and, and food. Like my husband is like, he knows I'm in here. I'm writing in the morning. Um, suggestions for stopping dialogue becoming flat. 
I think reading your dialogue out loud really helps. And there's a lot of books that I read where the dialogue is like, people don't talk like that. Like if I try to read it out loud and like, that's not how real people talk. And you don't want to be so realistic that you're like, hi, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? Like, that's not dialogue. Um, but another way to think about it is um, there's a there's a podcast that's like, it's newish. It's called The Dialogue Doctor. And he, he actually goes through dialogue really well. And he talks about... Um, can't remember the words exactly, but if you if you come up with a list of things that each character does and says, you know, um, there's regional differences to how we speak. Like some people say sneakers, some people say tennis shoes. There's other synonyms for words. So maybe I try to be like, okay, this character says maybe, and this character says perhaps, or something like little things like that, so that they're unique. And ideally, these kind of dialogue differences come from the person's background and experiences and all of that. So you you find a few like pieces of dialogue or actions that they do and make so that you can distinguish each character and make sure that they're unique and they don't sound the same because that can go into it being flat. I think flatness a lot of times is either they don't sound like human beings, they sound like robots, or they sound like perfect grammatical creations and people don't talk in perfect grammar, or they all sound the same because they sound like you. And uh, so those are some techniques that I think about when when doing when writing the dialogue and just keeping a list, like write like literally just writing it down. Like you know, X character says says this or has a catchphrase or or you know uses slang or or is very proper and doesn't use contractions, like something like that to just distinguish them. And then also reading it out loud. I also have the computer read it aloud to me. So I have a Mac. I don't know how you do it on a PC, but I'm sure it's possible with the accessibility, uh, um, you know, things. But you can have the computer voice read things back, and that's good for proofreading. But and even though it's a computer voice and it is literally flat, your mind kind of fills in things and you catch things, and um, it it can be a good way to to check not just your dialogue but all of your prose in general, if that is what you choose to do. If it's not, then enjoy the reading. It's always easier. <laughs> Sometimes it's like I write with my friend in the mornings, like because I still use accountability partners. Well, one, so she is extremely self motivated. She's been my friend since college, and so we get on Google Meet at eight o'clock, five days a week, and we write together for about an hour, hour and a half. And at least once a week, one of us is saying, "This is hard. Writing is really hard." <laughs> I think always remembering that. And my friend, she she's extremely prolific. She self published. She publishes like short books every month, and she's got three different pen names and. Um, but she's a full-time writer now. Uh, but yeah, however many books, over 50 books, maybe 100. I don't even know. I've, I can't keep track because she releases them so 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 quickly. It's hard. It's still hard. It's it's never not going to be hard. And that's okay. Like, you can do hard things. But it's also, I'm trying not to make it look easy. I hope I'm not doing that because it's not easy. It's just that you do it enough, it you, you know, you become used to it. Um, but I still struggle a lot. I originally created my podcast thinking it might be for readers, like to get behind the scenes. Although then I was like, well, I don't want to spoil anything, but it's a lot of, it's mostly writers who listen. Um, I think there are some readers too, who are just curious about how things work, but um, I do hear from writers. So that's always cool. And writers at different stages. I'm reading a book called The Conductors by Nicole Glover. It's like a fantasy history about the Underground Railroad, but with magic. <laughs> That's really cool. And then I'm usually reading two or three books at a time. I'm trying to figure out there was another book I was reading that's a romance, but I don't remember. It might not be worth remarking on. <laughs> it might be one of those things where it's like, yeah, I might finish it. I might not finish it. <laughs> but, uh, cause yeah, I've been DNFing a lot of things. The pandemic has been hard for reading been trying to um, keep up with the reading. T. Kingfisher, I love her. It's also Ursula Vernon, it's her pen name, but um, I just finished Paladin Strength, the second one. So these are like fantasy romances in sort of a clockworky world. What do you call that? Not steampunk, but maybe steampunk a little bit because they've got clockwork creatures. Um, yeah, it sounds like steampunk. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. 
but yeah, she's great. And the Paladin, the first book was Paladin's Grace, and this is Paladin's Strength, and they're really delightful. <laughs> if you like fantasy romance. Yeah. Michael has a question. Can you talk about how to create round characters? Mm. Like well rounded characters? I think that uh like three dimensional characters, it's sort of like the the dialogue, what I was talking about, dialogue is um because I, I I try to focus on like minor characters and making them pop off the page so that they're not cardboard cutouts. And it's all about motivations. Like everybody in your scene has their own motivation. They come into the scene with their own goal and their own reason for being there. And you might not always know that like on the first draft, you might not know that at all in the first draft, but by the last draft, you should know, like have an idea of why everyone is there. Not just the, maybe, maybe not just the POV character or the main character, but every character. And um, if everyone seems like they have an agenda, then they feel more real. If they're just sort of serving the main character's agenda, then they can be flat or they don't have any agency. Um, but yeah, part of the, that character thing is figuring out their journey and figuring out who's changing. You know, your main character has an arc generally. And well, they always have an arc. It can be a positive arc, a negative arc, or a flat arc, but there's some kind of something happening. Either the character is changing or the character is changing the world they're in. And we focus on the main characters, um, but every every character has that too. So know what trajectory your character is on in the book and even in the scene, because the scene trajectories, you know, build on each other to to make the whole the whole book. So if you think about in terms of how is this character going to change, or how is this character going to change their world, then that's one way to to make sure that they're not flat and, and boring. And have I written any scripts? Um, not since film school, <laughs> not really. I, my brother is actually an actor and we are talking about collaborating on a script together. He's a working actor. Um, and so, yeah, I haven't, I have to dust off my screenwriting skills, which are very rusty, um, but yeah. Nothing, nothing for real in many, many years. And it's a different skill. Like a lot of the, a lot of the craft books I have are, you know, talk about both, or they talk about what novel writers can learn from screenwriters. And a lot of times with craft books, they are telling you to watch movies because it's just faster than reading a whole book. So they'll know, okay, we'll tell you to watch Sounds of the Lambs and uh, go through all of the plot and structure craft things about that and then you can incorporate that into your books whereas if they told you to read silence of the lambs that would take you four or five times as long when you read others work do you have any pet peeves that bring you out of the story oh goodness yes all the time i'm a super picky reader um and i like to try things but i i, I do dnf which means do not finish uh Quite a, quite quite a few books. At one point, I'd, I was like, "Oh, I should finish every book I start." And people say that, and I'm like, oh, "Life's too short. I'm not going to finish these books if I don't like them." So, pet peeves. There was one book I was reading. I'm trying to remember now what it was. I had gotten through like 50% of it, and I was like, "I can't. I can't continue." There were too many things that didn't make sense. Like, I will, I will give you one or two sort of, not even non sequiturs, but irrational things that happen. Once you get to three and four, then it's like, I, I don't trust the author anymore. Um, it was things like there was, um, there's the main character who was like attacked by a jealous boyfriend and she killed him in self-defense. And the whole next sequence was like covering up this crime when it was obviously self-defense and there was no mention made of it. Something like that will, is a, is a pet peeve of mine when it just didn't, didn't make any sense to me. And I was like, kept reading, hoping they would explain like there was some reason why it wasn't obvious self-defense and she could have just called the police and, you know, but they dragged the body out and hit it. And I'm like, okay, that's just, just for the sake of the story. Um, and then poor characterization is a huge pet peeve. Choppy writing. You see this, um, you see this with newer writers and, and it's fine because we, I think we all go through that, but Sometimes self-published writers don't do enough work to make sure they're 
ready to self-publish and so they're putting out stuff which is just is not quite ready for the marketplace and the choppiness um so you know you'll have a character in a setting and then all of a sudden they're in the car and it's not a scene break or it's hard to describe because it doesn't sound as bad as it is but you have to make sure that you're bringing the character from one place to another uh and it can just be like she left and went to the car as opposed to she's sitting there talking to someone and then in the next sentence she's driving down the street things that are choppy that that always takes me out and um um yeah, those are the big things and then sort of opening lines uh like you're opening your first chapter your first page your first line should have tension if the opening line doesn't have any tension in it then i don't have a lot of hope for the rest of the book and that's why i always read the sample chapter like i'm a kindle reader so i'm, I'm reading ebooks primarily and i always read the, the sample chapter before i buy the book even if it's a free book <laughs> I kind of want to clutter my Kindle with with books that I'm not going to read. So if I'm not getting any tension in the first paragraph, then it's you know, on to the next book. Yeah. yeah, I have I have a lot of pet peeves. Uh, with fantasy and world building is is one too. Um, things that aren't thought out terribly well. Like there's a super popular fantasy series and it's very diverse and they've got people of all different races, but they all kind of, this continent is very small. And you're like, how did these people evolve to be, to look so differently when they are, live right next to each other? And there's no geographic or natural, you know, reasons for the evolution of the humans to be so different, so close together. And it's not like they had migration patterns, from, you know, it was like a nice try and I, it's, it's always nice to have diversity, but like, can you give us a, a better reason? Can you think about things like migration and, and evolving and um, how physical characteristics develop in people over, over time and all of that stuff. So those kinds of things will take me out. There was something else I was reading. Oh, what was it? I was, there was a book, Second World Fantasy, where they talked about the month January. And I was like, how do you have January when there's no Rome? And something, there was something else, lactic acid. There's a, a second world fantasy, like historical fantasy, horses and carts, where they're training and they're talking about get the lactic acid out, which is like when you work out and you get sore and you, you have to keep moving to something about the lactic acid that my husband's always talking about at the gym. But I was like, they're on horses and carts. Have they discovered lactic acid? Like, is that a thing they know about? <laughs> I have endless pet peeves. I, I will stop now, but and I stopped reading that book. I was like, I'm gonna go back to it. Sometimes I can push through, and sometimes I have to protect my brain and just be like, it's just not the book for me. Yes, can I describe choppy writing a bit more? When characters go from one place to another across scenes, you don't need to have them connect. If it's a different scene, then yes, they don't have to connect. You can you can end a scene. Whether you have a scene break or not, if it's very clear in the text that this is another location, either at the same time or at a different time, that's not choppy. Uh, choppy is sort of in the same scene, in the same motion. If if you don't, if they start outside and they're like, I'm going to go, you know, you see them walking up the front steps of a house and they talk about, I'm here to see my father in this house. And then all of a sudden they're inside, like no one rang the doorbell, no one answered the door. And not to say that you have to belabor those things because you shouldn't, but you have to connect one thought to another. You know, you have to at least have a sentence where I knocked on the door and he answered and I walked in. You know, you can summarize it. That's when you can tell instead of show because you don't have to press the door enough, wait. You know, you don't have to go through every action and describe everything. But within the course of a scene, like jumping from one place to another is is difficult to to parse so um like people will be, there was a, a thing i was reading a couple days ago where th these two people were talking they were inside a building they were talking there was a dialogue and then the next you know the dialogue ends and it's like and he he shifted into third gear well they were the last thing we saw was that they were in the the building they hadn't walked out to the car gotten in the car you, you don't have to say that he started the car but you can say they, they got they they left the building and went into the car you know something like that 
otherwise it was choppy because it, there's just a jump they could be having this conversation while they're leaving the building um but if the last action you see is in a different location than the next action there needs to be a bridge between those two things if it's in the same scene and then yeah cutting cutting a scene that was commuting that had no conflict is a great idea like it, i'm talking about were a few words or a sentence um not necessarily a whole scene because if you're you're saying i'm going to work yeah, unless something happens during the commute, you can just be like, and when I got to work, I saw so-and-so, or, you know, I sat down on my desk at work after the drive or something like that to, to introduce the concept that there was a commute, but we didn't need to read about it. Uh, Susan was asking about your process for world building and what sort of things you research. Yes, sorry, I skipped that one. Um, I research everything, <laughs> which is not a good answer. Um, but I don't do it up front. So with world building, it's like, it depends on how the story comes to me. For Earth Singer Chronicles, the world's developed along with the story. And usually that's how it works. Like I'll have some fixed points and then I will come into st come across story problems that um, then I have to figure out an answer for. So I started Earth Singer Chronicles knowing that there were you know, I had this this guy who had been captured. He was been spying, and he was captured, and this, and he was with these soldiers who were coming towards this girl's home, and she was on the porch with her shotgun. And then it was like, okay, well, who are these two factions? So they are two countries that have been at war for five hundred years. Why are they at war? Okay, well, one has magic, one has do one doesn't have magic. But how come the people with magic haven't overridden the people without magic? Oh, well, there was a magical barrier there. So. As I continued with the story, it was like back and forth, back and forth, a little bit of story, a little bit of world to explain something that I needed explained. And sometimes I would take a take a break from the story and build out the world. And uh, so then I was researching, okay, what are you know the the I started with geography because in fantasy that was really helpful to know why they're at war also that not just the magic but resources were at play so one country didn't have resources because it was a desert and it was surrounded by mountains and there's all these other reasons that come out of that and then okay well in a desert surrounded by mountains what are their food sources how, how does transportation develop um did they have you know a train cars is that well they're isolated from everyone else so they weren't sharing knowledge and technology and then you think about economy and trade and education and all of that stuff. And then I have other countries in this world that I was developing too. And so not at the beginning, but when I needed to know when they were going to either talk about another country or someone from that country was going to come into play or visit or you know be a character in the scene, then I needed to know like the minimum about it until I needed to know more. You know, so I try because world building can be infinite. And there are many people who spend many years building a world and never write a book. And I did not want to be one of those people. So that's kind of how I approached it. I, I knew what I, I needed to know. And I went beyond that because I found that I needed to know the history. It, it, it's a 500 year history. And there were eight breach wars. So basically eight distinct times when the magical barrier was breached and they had an actual conflict. And sometimes that conflict would last 100 years. And then the the magic would come back and, and the breach would seal again. So I did at one point write 500 years of history in like a few pages, just overviews of all of the wars, what caused them so that the characters could be like, oh, and back in the third war, you know, like they would know this history. So I needed to know the history. But yeah, everything from like transportation, economic systems, governmental systems, I wanted the different countries to have different types of government and how would that work? Um, trade, food, like where they're getting their food from, how does the water work, like a little bit about everything. So just like surface level knowledge about all of these topics so that I could create the world and have it feel real and have it feel motivated. You know, there, if there was conflicts between nations, why were there was, there was conflicts there and going back into the history of who was an ally to whom and all of that stuff. Uh, so sometimes I'd be like, I'd write a scene and I would need a fire extinguisher. And this is like an alternate 1920s fantasy world. So I was like, well, when were fire extinguishers created? And I have to research that. Or um, 
telegraphs. Like, when were, well, that was in the 1800s, I think, but portable telegraphs. Like, that was actually a real thing. And sometimes I would use the real knowledge and just make it fantasy or, you know, fudge it a little bit because it didn't have to be perfectly real. It just, portable telegraphs are a thing and I can use them. So it's fine. Um, so, yeah, things like that, like all, all kinds of stuff. Researching can be anything you need in the scene. I, there's goats in a scene. I happened to go to a bed and breakfast and they had goats in the barn. So I was like, oh, I'm, I'm writing about goats. Can I go see your goats? <laughs> um, and also because I didn't want it, I mean, because it is second world fantasy, and it didn't have to hew too closely to anything real. I, I combined traits of goats from around the country, around the world. So no one could say, oh, my goats don't act like that. Like I could have a goat expert read the book. And so I was, I, I did that with everything uh, as much as possible. So it wasn't one culture and it wasn't based on one country. It was based on a lot of different things and the pieces of things that I would combine so that I'm not appropriating anyone's culture, but I also don't have to hew too closely. And my research can be surface level. It doesn't have to be as deep as someone who is basing their entire culture on something that's actually real. And they have, they owe a lot to, to that. And they have to be careful and be respectful about, you always want to be respectful, but yeah, I, I purposefully wanted to like, even with um the food and like vegetables and stuff, I made up a lot of names for plants and vegetables, uh, but I, I took from real ones and then I like, combined words and things like that. So it wasn't anything too, too realistic. And that was one of the ways that I, uh, that I just approached making my own world and making sure that it was unique and different than anything that anyone else has done. But um, yeah, so now it's still the same. I look in the new, in the new book that I'm working on, it's, it's a paranormal romance. So it's not epic fantasy. It's not creating a whole new world. It's like a futuristic version of San Francisco that I am using, but within that I'm, I'm taking the real city and applying um, the shifter culture to it. So creating culture is, is similar. It's like you have cultural practices, you figure out why they do those things, like where did they come from? What were the, the motivations behind them? And that way they can feel more rich and realistic as opposed to, I just want them to do this thing, to have this, this strange dance. And I think it will be cool on the page if they have this dance. Well, that's fine. But then like, where did the dance come from? And what is, is there like uh, a myth that associated with it? Was there a god or a goddess or some kind of spirit? Or are they mimicking an animal or, um, you know, a weather system or a star system or something? And some of that is researching like real life myths and real life cultural practices from different places and then changing them so that, and I did that with Earth Singer Chronicles too. Um, so yeah, world building, you can go pretty deep into it. <laughs> uh, and for another project, I'm trying to do the least amount of world building possible. But I don't have to go too deep. Um, just because it's like a work for hire thing and I don't have as much time as I had for my, my other projects. So yeah, hopefully that answered the question. It's um, it kind of depends on your interest level and uh, how much you enjoy it, I think. I, I really like it. So I'm I'm curious about everything and I, I just want everything to feel real, you know? Have you ever had a situation in your writing when you thought there was only one way out for your protagonist and then you discovered a hole in your climax? There's lots of plot holes and I write myself into corners quite frequently. Um, usually though, if, if I go into something thinking that there's, hmm, there's only one way out usually that is the way and something else has to change like usually if i'm thinking that then the groundwork i've laid up until that point is pointing in that direction and so to change it would not just be a hole it would have the ripple effects all the way throughout so there's usually a different way to do it You're like okay this is still the way out but how how do you patch the hole with like the least amount of work, I guess. Uh, but still, you know, like a story is like an arrow and well, this is a good metaphor or not. This is just coming to me right now. You know, sometimes it can move around like arrows don't do that, but let's, let's pretend they did. Um, but they're still basically going in the same direction. 
And to change that that direction is probably going to ripple out more. So yeah, it's, it's a tough question. It's, it's tough, but um, plot holes, like I had a plot hole yesterday. I had written myself into a little corner and I had to kind of go back to, this, to the chapter before, rewrite that chapter and then keep moving. But the, um, the overall trajectory of the story and the actions are the same. Some of the things around them or the way that they happen are different. And hopefully that makes sense. Uh, do you have any thoughts on drawing from existing cultures respectfully in fantasy while avoiding appropriation? I mentioned changing names and combining characteristics. Yeah, that's that's really how I do it. Um, in Ursinger Chronicles, there is like a seafaring people, an island nation. And I looked at, you know, Pacific Islanders, but I also looked at like other island cultures, like in like the Indian Ocean and in other places. And there's similarities there. Like there's a lot of tattooing and there's, you know, just the way that they, with boats and the way that they build their boats and navigate. Um, but I wanted to make sure that they were from different parts of the world and I was really combining things. I, there's a desert culture and I looked at deserts from like Afghanistan to Southwest United States and looked for the, the things that were in common with desert communities. And so I wasn't pulling from one place. I was pulling from a variety of desert communities. Same thing with cities. And, you know, I looked at European cities, American cities, you know, Asian cities. Um, so for me, it's just about taking the, the kind of the geography. And because I think for, for me, it all goes back to geography, like a cold climate, different cold climates are going to do things somewhat similarly. And obviously there's a lot of differences too, but what are the similarities that cold climates, whether it's like in Europe or Asia um, or America, what do they do? And that way I felt like I was going to be able to avoid appropriation because uh, I was just creating something new out of the raw materials of the location. And I wasn't interested in, in having analogs to existing cultures. And the naming, I had naming conventions for everything, like uh, for, for people when I would do, I didn't do like a whole con line, like I, I didn't create my own language at all, but the names of people from different countries, I, I, I picked certain letters that were very prominent in different languages. So that like in Alcira, there's a lot of Q's and Z's in their name, um, things like that. So that's another way that I, I approached because naming things gives them, you can create analogs, even if you don't intend to, if you, if everyone has sort of a, like a Hispanic or Latin sounding name, then people are going to be like, oh, that must be an analog to that culture. But if you mix it up and change it, then that, and that's a way to, to avoid that. When you look at a random chapter of your books, how much is show versus tell in your work? I do, hmm, that's a good question. I mean, I do focus on on the showing. Like telling is important when you need to shortcut things. Everything can't be shown because it's too much. So I don't know, like percentage wise, but if you think about the purpose of the scene and trying to stay true to the purpose of the scene, I also often diagram my scenes before I write them. And so I know I use, um, it's like a cobbled together system between two different systems, but I always know basically six things. I have a little index card on my desk. So it's the desire. So what the main character wants going in, the inciting incident of the scene, the progressive complications, the turning point, the crisis, the climax and the resolution. And whenever I'm stuck in a scene, I go back to these things, which are seven things. And um, a lot of these are explained in Robert McKee's book story and in the book, The Story Grid by Sean Coyne. And so if I get, so that kind of grounds me and I know what the point of the scene is. And so I know what needs to be shown to create the emotion and what you can skim over because it's not that important and it's not creating emotion and it's not one of these seven points. Um, and so it might, you know, show don't tell is, is really helpful, but I, I, I don't know, maybe 50, 60% of the book is, or of a random scene is probably showing which was 40 to 50 percent is still telling um 
but yeah, I'd, I'd be interested and I'd probably go back and see exactly how much it is. Because, you know, creative telling, um, interesting telling is, is fine. It's the boring telling we don't like. Any other questions, comments? If not, we can uh, we can wrap up a little bit early. I know Leslie, you were saying your uh, your voice was gone about forty minutes ago, so I'm sure it's even more gone now. But you're glad you had your tea with you, huh? Yes, yes, I always have tea. Yeah, my <laughs> voice it's it's still here a little bit. It's it's in various stages of being gone. <laughs> well, well, thanks, everybody. Guys, um, Anything else? Yeah, we can go ahead and wrap up. Just a reminder that we are, you know, doing um, this program as well as some other programs. Take a look at sloverlibrary.com or go on to Eventbrite to find out what else we're doing. We have our uh, Right Now Creative Writing Program uh, happening later on this month. So if you want to come and, you know, have your creative juices flowing and, and come up with some answers to some interesting prompts, please join us. We still have room for folks and I hope to see everybody uh, later on online or maybe in person someday soon. So have a great night, everyone. Thank you guys.